a number of folks who say that they accept the first four in some cases, I think what's actually happening is that they agree with the theological conclusions of the first four rather than submitting to the decision of the first four. So I think about when you approach the Nicene Creed, for instance, is you're declaring the Nicene Creed a result primarily of having thought through every phrase in the creed and decided you agree with it, and so now you can say the creed? Or do you see yourself as actually putting yourself under the authority of the church and submitting yourself to the church's reading of scripture? So for instance, hmm. the examples I think about, my, my, uh, one of my children when she was four didn't believe in the Trinity. Uh, she said, I said something about, uh, you know, well, Jesus is God. And she said, uh, no, no, you, he's the son of God. I said, well, he's both. Mm-hmm. She looked at me, she goes, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> this little four-year-old uh, rejecting the Trinity. Uh, or you could take on the complete opposite end. The, the New Testament scholar Wayne Grudem for a while uh, rejected the Nicene Creed because he said he couldn't find consubstantiality as a concept in scripture. Now he's changed mm-hmm. his mind since then. But he hasn't submitted. He's never submitted to the creed, I would say. He's just now he agrees with the creed. And so I think one of the questions we have to ask about the councils is when we when we say we accept them, are what we say, are we saying that we agree with their theological conclusions? Or are we saying that we actually see ourselves as under the authority of those councils? And one of the things I'd say is that the councils claim that they are interpreting scripture authoritatively. I'd say that's what the creed does as well. This creed is not over scripture. The creed is not um, a higher authority than scripture, but the creed is the authoritative interpretation of scripture. If you disagree with the creed, you're disagreeing with scripture, if that makes sense. And the councils right. claim a similar authority. I, I was pulling up uh, the Canon 1 of Ephesus in 431. I'm just going to read a little bit, if you don't mind. Yeah, please. Uh, the, 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 the conciliar fathers wrote, Whereas it is needful that they who were detained from the Holy Synod and remained in their own district or city for any reason, ecclesiastical or personal, should not be ignorant of the matters which were thereby decreed. So if you couldn't make it to the council, it's important, whatever the reason is, it's important that you know what we talked about. We therefore notify your holiness and charity that if any metropolitan of a province forsaking the Holy and Ecumenical Synod has joined the assembly of the apostates or shall join the same hereafter, He has no power in any way to do anything in opposition to the bishops of the province, since he is already cast forth from all ecclesiastical communion and made incapable of exercising his ministry. But he shall himself be subject in all things to those very bishops of the province and shall be degraded from his episcopal rank. That's the um, shaft translation from the uh, Nicene and post-Nicene fathers. So, in other words, Ephesus assumes that its decisions are binding, and it Mm. doesn't, the, the ecumenical councils want to be persuasive. They have their arguments to try to persuade you, but they assume that they have the authority to bind uh, Christians. And so the one thing that I would sort of challenge people on is, is do you, if, if you don't think the church has that authority, then you might agree with ecumenical councils, but you don't accept any of the ecumenical councils on their own uh, generic, that is genre-based uh, planes. And I, just briefly, I think the rationale for the reason that Ephesus can be so bold in the first place is they look at, at, at Acts chapter 15, the Jerusalem council, and they don't see that St. James and the council together, they make the decision. St. James promulgates it. They don't see St. James saying, Hey, I really think this is the right idea. And I hope you all agree. St. James seems to assume that they can write to the other churches and say, this is what we decided period. Mm, um, right. And that's based also in the, in the theology of the church and the farewell discourse in John chapters 14 through 17, the promise that the Holy Spirit would lead into all truth in John 16, 13 and and 14, 26 is primarily related to um, the writing of scripture. I think he'll call all things to remembrance whatsoever I've said unto you, but it also, it's to the church in in 1720. uh, Jesus says, I pray, neither pray I for these alone, but for them who shall believe on me through their word. And so the church's authority, the promise that the Holy Spirit will lead into all truth, applies somehow to the church. I don't th- it doesn't make the church infallible in every respect or incapable of error. I think it means that the, that the, um, the gospel is preserved at every, at every stage in church history, even if we think that at times the truth of the gospel was um, impeded or, or, or mixed with, with, with other things. Um, the gospel is nevertheless maintained. 
And I think it also means that the church at every era has the capability of speaking authoritatively, just like um, the, the Council of James. So that's a, that's the first thing I think it's it's important to say. So so when we accept the first four, if we're going to accept them, we're, we're submitting to them, which I right. don't think everyone who says they accept the councils actually do. Um,